Okay, so um, I decided to talk more about literal equations. I um, Literal equations are talked about along with formulas, and I thought it'd be really good to kind of go into depth about what they are and why they are useful. Um, I, this term I've been focusing a lot on the whys and, you know, why we do things the way that we do to hope, hopefully see how these things can connect to what you may be doing in other fields. So first, what is a literal equation? So the word literal has many meanings, but the meaning that we use for math comes from the Latin word litera. Um, I actually think it's pronounced litera. I'm not entirely sure on that, but it comes from the Latin word for letter. So that's where literal comes from, and that's why we call the types of equations we look at literal equations. So literal equations are made up of mostly letters. So most formulas are considered literal equations. So it just comes from literally the word for a letter. So when we solve these things, we use the same rules that we use when we solve things with numbers. So we still use our properties of equality where we can add back to multiply and divide from both sides. We can still distribute we can um, do what is called like factoring, which you will learn about um, in a couple weeks. I don't think that's coming up next week. It might be next week or the week after. Um, but all the, the tricks that we use to get a variable by itself, we do the same thing here with literal equations. It's just instead of having a number to work with, we use letters. It may not simplify nicely, but it does create a formula that you can use and then all you need to do is plug in numbers and you don't have to solve it every time. Um, so why should you know how to do this? Is if you need to come up with formulas. So I'm sure you've heard of the quadratic formula which is used to solve a quadratic equation which you'll learn about in a couple weeks. Um, but that's an equation of the form ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. And when you solve that equation using a technique called completing the square, which you don't have to learn about in this class, but when you solve it with that technique, that's what gives you the quadratic formula. So the shortcut we have for solving that comes from solving the literal equation using techniques that we know. And then once we get a formula, we don't have to go through those steps anymore. We just plug in the numbers. So that's where solving a literal equation comes in handy. Um, this is also great if you're doing things in Excel and you need to compute something, you may need to solve an equation to figure out what cells that you need because usually an Excel formula, you're not working with actual numbers, but you're working with references to things. So your cell formula, you might have like equals A2 times maybe the sum of B2 through B6 six or you know you're going to have all these formulas in there and you're not working with the actual numbers when you write excel formulas you're actually working with basically a literal equation and so you might know what you're trying to compute you might have to go solve something so that you get the outcome that you want and then you can plug that into excel and then it'll always compute that for you so being able to solve a literal equation is really handy here some other uses of literal equations are for programming. So um, if when we have homework systems like Connect Math, you may wonder, well, how, you know, it gives me an equation. Every time I do the equation or do the problem, it gives me different numbers. How does it know what the answer is? Well, someone has programmed it and they've solved the equation with variables instead of numbers so that they know what form the outcome is going to look like and then all they have to do is plug in the numbers and they can do that e with a computer and then that way they can check your answer. So for example, if you're solving an equation like 2x plus 5 equals 10 and you're solving for x, in the background when you program something like this, you actually have the letters for each of those numbers and then you solve for x with the letters and that gives you a formula and all you have to do is plug in random numbers. So you just generate random numbers, plug them in, and then the system knows what the answer is supposed to be. So if you go into programming and if for whatever you ever have to program something like Connect Math or any other kind of homework system, 
um, in science they use things like this, um, engineering. You have to actually figure out the formula for each problem in the background so that you can create um, a, a problem that will know what the answer is every time. I am actually doing this right now because I am working on a circuit analysis class and we are creating homework or we're creating quiz questions where it will just determine random numbers. It'll plug it, it will give you an equation of random numbers, and then you have to solve. And so I have to go through and solve the equation without the numbers so that I know what the form of the output looks like so that I can program it that way. So that way it will check your answer. So this is something that I am doing, and I'm not a programmer, but I'm a mathematician and I have to do this. Um, and also related to programming is that usually when you write a program, a lot of programs you have to compute some number. Um, you plug in some numbers and then it gives you the output answer. And it's not always solving an equation or math related, but it could be just you're, you're doing a lot of things in the background, like maybe you're trying to find the area of something or you're running something a certain number of times. And so you have to work with variables all the time in programming. And a lot of times you're adding, subtracting and solving for things with letters because you don't know what the numbers are. Those are going to be plugged in by the user. So you have to work with variables instead. So this skill is really good for those who are going into programming, but it's also helpful for anybody who has to write a formula or use Excel to have some idea of how to come up with your equation. So I'm going to just start with some simple ones, work more complicated, kind of give you a wide variety of the sort of the techniques that you use. So the first one here, we're going to solve C plus D equals E for the letter D. So I'm going to start by rewriting our equation. So we're solving for D. So that means that I want D by itself. So I want to keep D on this side, which means I need to remove C. So just like when we had numbers to remove something from like the left to the right side or from the right to the left, you have to add or subtract. So if there's no minus sign in front of the letter, we assume that it's positive. So we're going to subtract C from both sides. Now, with a literal equation, when we subtract, we want to combine it with like terms. So if there was something on the right with a letter C, I could subtract there, but there isn't. They're different letters. So I can't actually subtract it from E because it's not the same letter. So I just write it off to the side. So sometimes what helps some people is they write 0 C there. So you can see, OK, I'm subtracting it from 0 C, and then I'm subtracting C. So you have something to kind of line it up with. But you don't have to. So just as a note, what we just used was the addition property of equality. The same thing that we use solving for x when we have numbers. So it's the exact same rules. We're just working with letters instead. It's more abstract, which kind of in some aspect is related to abstract algebra, but abstract algebra is like a it's a high level math class where everything is you're you're looking at the properties with no numbers at all. Here we are we're doing some stuff with properties and letters, but we're not getting too deep into it. We're just doing some simple solving. So I'm subtracting C from both sides. So my C minus C, that cancels out because it would be like 1 minus 1, which is 0. So all I'm left with is D on the left. And then I have E minus C. So you just literally write down what you see. So that's another use. The other definition of literal is that you you write down exactly what you see. You don't actually have to do any arithmetic. You don't have to add. You don't have to subtract. You don't have to do any thinking. You're just writing down exactly what you see. And then I have my D by itself, so that is your answer. So 
we just solved that equation for D. Didn't have to do any numbers, it just was one step, and you just literally write down what you are seeing following the rules. So it's the most abstract thing you can do, it's like the most rule following thing you can do. <laughs> Are there any questions on this example? Okay, so here's my next one and we're solving y equals 35 plus x for x. So we do have a number in here, but it's still considered a literal equation because we have more than one variable. So we've got two variables. And this is actually a special type of equation called a linear equation in two variables that we'll look at in week seven. So you're gonna have to be solving things like this once you go into week seven, but you're getting sort of a preview here. So I'm going to start by writing it down. And I'm solving for x. So I want my x to be by itself. So that means I need to remove the 35. So this is familiar. If we need to get rid of 35, we're going to subtract 35 from both sides. Now 35 and y are not like terms. So I'm going to put it off to the side. Now there are two different ways to write this. You can write it exactly as you see it, but you would have to put a plus sign in between there. So you could write negative 35 plus y equals, and then 35 minus 35 is zero. So you're left with x. Or what we do most of the time is put the y first and do y minus 35 because it just kind of seems to flow better. And if you write it the other way around, do y minus 35. And if you decide to write it that way, usually what I end up doing is putting the minus 35 underneath the y so I could just go top to bottom, y minus 35. But it's up to you whichever way makes more sense to you. They're both correct answers. They're just written in a different order. And that's because we can rearrange the order of addition because of the commutative property. So they're equivalent because of the commutative proper, property. So first, our first step that we did here was the subtraction property of equality because we subtracted from both sides. I'm just gonna label that. And then the ability to go from one version of the equation to the other is because of the commutative property of addition, where you can rearrange the order of things that are added. So we're using two basic rules of algebra to solve and to put it in a form that just seems a little nicer to look at. Any questions? Okay. Now I have one here that's D equals RT, and we're solving for R. So D equals RT is actually a formula called the distance formula. That means distance equals rate times time. And you often do need to either solve it for R or for T. So I'm going to rewrite it. We've got D equals RT. And when you've got two variables next to each other, like the R and the T, if there's no plus or minus, that's multiplication. So that's R times T. So if we want R by itself, we need to get rid of the T. And because it's multiplied, we need to do the opposite. So we're going to divide both sides by T. And we're going to do this by writing it as a fraction because basically 
in algebra, whenever we divide things from both sides, we always write it as a fraction. So when you do that, the T, those T's cancel and you're left with just the R. So you end up with D over T equals R. Now you solve for R because you have the R by itself. So we did one step here, and what we used in this case was the division property of equality. And what's really nice is that you don't, when you create a fraction, but you don't have to reduce it or anything because there's no numbers. So you just leave it exactly as a fraction. You don't have to worry about doing anything to it other than writing what you see. So now I'm going to move on. Um, I've got only two more examples because I wanted to focus more on just seeing what you need to do. I, we don't need to do these all day. Um, this one here, we've got 3 times x plus y equals z, and we're solving for x. So I'm going to start by rewriting, and we want to get x. So I need to get that x by itself. Um, there are multiple steps that we can do here. Because I've got this 3 in front, we could divide both sides by 3 to get rid of that in front, and then I'm left with x plus y. Or you can multiply through and then solve from there. So we've got kind of two choices here to solve. So... They will get you basically equivalent answers. They'll be the same. They'll just look different, but they will be exactly the same. So let's say I want to try the dividing aspect. And so if I want to get x by itself, the first thing I need to do is get rid of that 3 in front of the parentheses, because then I can make the parentheses disappear. So since that's 3 times x plus y, I can divide both sides by 3. And that gives me x plus y equals z over 3. Or if you wanted to, you could write that as 1 third z. That would be the same thing. Then we want to subtract y from both sides because I want just the x. So this would give me x equals, and let's say I decide to write this as 1 third instead of z over 3, so that's 1 third z minus y. So that's one option to get you a formula for this. Now the second choice is to distribute the 3 through the parentheses before you do anything else. So if I multiply 3 through the parentheses, that would give me 3x plus 3y equals z. So the steps are going to be a little different, but the equation will be equivalent. And equivalent means whatever numbers you plug in, you'll get the same answer. So if I'm trying to get x by itself, I need to first get rid of the 3y. So we will subtract 3y from both sides. So that leaves me with 3x equals z minus 3y. Now I want x, I don't want 3x, so we're going to divide everything by 3. So I could make one big giant fraction on the right, or I can just divide everything by 3. So on the left, the 3 divided by 3 is x. And you can see we get this z over 3, which is the 1 third z minus and then 3 divided by 3 is 1, 
So you get your minus y. So you get the same answer. You just did them two different ways. But the answers are the same. Um, so the nice thing about literal equations like this is that you can kind of do what, what makes sense to you, what looks like a, you know, if the first thing you see is, oh, I'm going to divide both sides by three, you can do that. If the first thing you think of is multiplying three through the parentheses, you can also do that. And also equivalent is if I had done z minus 3y over 3. So if I hadn't split it up and divided both sides by 3, but just did the whole thing over 3, that is also a valid answer. Because if you split up that fraction, when you add fr fractions, you combine them. So if you just reverse the adding of the fraction, you would get the same answer. So there are multiple ways to write these answers, and they're all correct as long as you follow the, the, the correct steps. You know, if you're following the rules of algebra, you're doing all of that correct, then your answers, even if they look different from what somebody else has, they're equivalent, and they'll get you the same answer. You can verify that by plugging in a number for y and z and seeing if you get the same answer in both equations. So usually whichever equation you use is a matter of what you're more comfortable with, what maybe looks easier to work with. If I was plugging in numbers, I'd probably use the top one that I have in green because that way I don't have to multiply by a fraction. So I can do work with whole numbers and then divide at the very end. So I might find that easier to work with than like the one third z, but it's they're the same thing. It's all in kind of what, what are you working with? If you're programming, it might be easier to program with the one on the bottom than on the top, depending on, you know, what you're trying to do. It might be easier to put into your calculator the one on the bottom than the one on the top. So um, that's sort of why we have multiple ways to solve and there's equivalent things because they're useful in different circumstances. Are there any questions on this example? No, ma'am. Okay, so my last one, this one is also formula. This comes from physics. So this is the formula for the force between two objects in space, um, specifically if things are very, very far away. So we have F equals G times M times a little m over d squared for little m. So when we work with equations, capitalization matters. A capital M is different from a little m. So that's especially important when you're entering things in Connect Math because if you use the wrong capitalization, it will mark it wrong because it's a different variable. So capitalization matters, and that's really important here because we're using both big and little m. So here we want to solve for little m. So I'm going to start by rewriting the equation. And then I got to be very careful about making my m's look different. So something like this I usually do in, in step by step. I could solve it all in one step and be really clever, but I'm going to do it a little bit at a time. So we want to get little m by itself. First thing I would do is get rid of the fraction. So we get rid of the fraction by multiplying both sides by the denominator. So I'm going to multiply both sides by d squared. So it doesn't matter which order you write d, you can write it d squared times f, you can do f times d squared um, personal preference, I usually put my capitals first, but it really doesn't matter. You can write it with the alphabetical order if you want, um, but I'm going to just put my capitals first. So I'm going to have FD squared equals G, M, and little m. So again, we're looking for little m. Now I have f times d squared on the left, or f d squared. 
And then we've got G times M times little m. So I want to divide by G and I want to divide by M because those are both multiplied. I want to divide by big M because we want little m. And those are multiplied, so you do the opposite, so you're going to divide. Now, I can do these all in one step because I'm dividing both of them. So that you could do two different steps, divide and then divide again. But it's easier if you just do it all in one step like this. So if you divide, you can see the G's cancel, the big M's cancel, and then we're left with little m there on the right. And so we have F D squared over G capital M equals little m. So I'm also trying to make my little m curved, my capital pointy to help keep those separate. But now you have a formula. Little m is the mass of one of the objects you're finding the force in between. So maybe like the smaller of the two. If you're, so if you're looking for like the force between Earth and Jupiter, Earth is smaller than Jupiter, so Earth would be a little m. So you can use this formula to figure out what the mass of the Earth is. Um, because now you've solved for m, and then you can find the mass of any object as long as you know the force, the distance, the mass of the thing, that the bigger one, and then g is a gravitational constant. So instead of solving every time, you just have to plug in the numbers, and then that will give you the mass here. Are there any questions? No, oh, ma'am. Okay. So this was my last example. So hopefully this um, kind of give you some further insight to solving some practice of the rules and seeing how it works with different variables, um, especially because as we go further through the class, you're going to start adding in other variables. And so you're going to need to get practice of seeing things that more than just X, you're going to have like X and Y or A and B and things like that. So um, this kind of gives you a preview of what to do when you have those multiple variables.